I'm John Beltman. For those of you who I haven't met, I teach a wide variety of woodworking classes at North House, and um, and I've been teaching for over 20 years. And I was uh, very pleased when I was asked to uh, to make introductions tonight uh, for this this talk. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to what Curtis has to say about draw knives because I believe that of all the the edge tools that we all have filling up our our toolboxes, the um, the draw knife is is quite possibly the most versatile and useful tool that that a person can have. And um, although I only met Curtis this past week, and and that only via Zoom. Um, I've been aware of Curtis for quite some time, for probably 25 years, um, at a time when I first became interested in, in Windsor chairs and building Windsor chairs. And, and Curtis was already at that time a very, very well established uh, Windsor chair builder and, and one of the few men in, in the country, few people in the country who was at that time building traditional chairs with traditional tools one at a time and, uh, and doing it full time. And I think it's, um, it's probably accurate to say that at this point, Curtis has put in his 10,000 hours on the draw knife. So tonight's speaker, Cooters Buchanan, he's been building Windsor chairs since 1984 in a one-man shop in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And his chairs are in the permanent collections of the Tennessee State Museum, the Southern Highlands Craft Guild, the Tennessee State Governor's Mansion, and also Monticello, the uh, home of, of uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, is it, it, as if that wasn't uh, uh, by itself impressive enough, he's also co-founded uh, Greenwood, a sustainable forestry project in Latin America, and also co-founded Jonesboro Locally Grown, a, uh, a local food initiative right in Tennessee. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn the screen over to uh, tonight's featured guest, the very talented Curtis Buchanan. Oh, well, hi everyone. Thanks so much, John. That's very, very nice. Um, so I'm gonna attempt to show you what I know about a draw knife uh, uh, tonight and uh, I'll field questions uh, throughout it. So just, uh, you know, just go on the, Q&A button there and you can type it in and John will uh, <clears throat> tell me what they are. Um, just keep them specific to what I'm talking about at that moment because I get distracted real easy and when you might not get me back. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, and I won't be doing it from, from right here. Uh, uh, Eric Conazaro has been working with me for a while and I'm getting ready to lose him. He's headed back up to uh, Vermont, where he's from, in about a about a month, and uh, but uh, he's going to film with his uh, uh, cell phone, so I'll be able to roam around the shop and talk and show you stuff. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to mute the uh, uh, the what is this thing, the laptop, <clears throat> and then uh, go to the bench. So see you in just uh, just a second. Yes, sir. Okay, I think I think folks can hear you now. Okay, ready. We can hear you guys. Thank you. Okay. So, so um, I've got. Uh, I mean, as you can see behind me, my draw knives hang up here. I've got a problem with them. It's about the only tool that I'll buy that I don't need anymore of. But it's just hard to pass them up, especially especially these right here. Th this type. Uh, you know, they're 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 unique in the fact that they were made during a time when the industrial revolution and hand tool work overlap. And so there were uh, blacksmiths working in these uh, manufacturing uh, locations that were just cranking out draw knives and they were so good, they were so practiced that nobody will ever be able to do what they did again. Now, not that we can't make good draw knives now. In fact, the 
the steel that they can use and a tempering process and all that is much more sophisticated. Uh, you know, these, the, the holding an edge on these can range everywhere from, you know, the magic draw knife that's made from you know, Thor's sword or something all the way to something that just can't hold its edge. But, uh, but, the, but the laminations that on them are just impeccable. You can, you can only pick them up when everything's perfectly slick. They're beautiful knives. And, and they were made, I don't know how many years they were made, uh, maybe 40 or 50 years these things were made. And they come under all kinds of different names. This one's a Witherby, pretty common, a good knife. Uh, a lot of them were names of, uh, of uh, hardware stores like Worth. And maybe they were Witherby's. Maybe Witherby was making those for for work. But uh, but Texto, Swan, uh, Jennings. This is a Jennings right uh, right here. Uh, <clears throat> Greenlee's, Barton's are some of my favorites. Uh, and there's there's a variety of ways that they were made. There were straight ones, like uh, let's see if I can find a straight one. Right. Now. <clears throat> So there's ones that were made straight here and straight and instead of, they don't go down this way and have a belly in them like this one right here. Some curves like this, and then it also curves this way. Now I'm told by blacksmiths that that's a result of the metal cooling and pulling to the weak, to the weak side or away from weak side or whatever it is. Uh, but they, they, they make these be beautiful curves. I don't think there's any function to, to, to that. Uh, and, uh, but, but those are the ones that I, that I prefer and will buy. But, so I'm gonna break, break them down into two categories for you first. And one would be the bevel down draw knife and one's the bevel up. And most of you have probably heard of this and you might even know how they're distinguished. And I have no idea if the people making these things thought anything about that. I have no idea at all, Pro probably didn't. Uh, what what I, I didn't even hear it mentioned until maybe about 30 years ago uh, and I forget who the first person was I heard and then I started paying attention to it <clears throat> and it only thing it has to do with is the position of your wrist so on this knife right here the back of this knife is in line with the tang of the handles just straight down in line with it and I use it as a bevel down knife and the reason why, when you're working with it, you've got it in position, you've got it sitting on your stock, your wrist is, is in a comfortable position. That's it, okay? This one, the reason I've got it out is because it is canted, the blade is canted like, like this. So you can see that in relationship to the tang, uh, <clears throat> the handle tang. And if you try to use it with the bevel down, you can, but you've got to put your wrist in an uncomfortable position. But if you use it bevel up, it lays really nice right on, right on the stock. And same way with this one, if you try to turn it over and use it bevel up, then you're having to move your wrist like that. You can use this one bevel up. And I will at times, uh, in fact, to cut, uh, if I'm cutting on some end grain, for instance, say I'm beveling the back of a, of, of a chair seat, Oh, I forgot to tell you what I do. I make I make Windsor chairs and and I carve a lot of spoons too, but I make Windsor chairs for a living. So uh, anyway, well I guess maybe John told you that. <laughs> I forgot. So anyway, uh, if you're beveling the back the back of that seat and you get around to that that, that end grain, uh, the draw knife's the perfect tool for doing it. You can use a spoke shape to do that, but nothing. I mean, the draw knife is low angle as you can get, and it just cuts it clean as a whistle, one stroke. If you've got it. And if you turn it with the bevel up when you're on that end grain and lay that back flat on the wood surface, it just tracks right around. Whereas if you've got the bevel down, it's a little harder to hold steady. It's moving, it's like driving a sports car or something as opposed to a Cadillac down the interstate, you know, it just tracks, tracks with you. But you can't do that on uh, uh, just a, a, a face grain because the bevel, just like with a chisel, the bevel will push, will push the draw knife down and into the work and you can't get it out of it. Okay. Now, so that would be, so that would be the difference in them. The use of them is a little bit different too. While you can, you can use either knife 
for any of the operations. Um, I will divide them up really. So the bevel up knife, I like for pulling straight, roughing out stock or getting a good straight line on, on the stock. And I don't mean straight, I mean following along wood fibers whenever I say straight, because we don't make much straight. Uh, and uh, so the reason it does that so well is because it can lay down, once again, just like I was talking about this one on that end grain, it can lay down almost flat on that surface and you aren't, you don't have that bevel bouncing around all over the place trying to control it. Um, so, uh, so that's specifically what I would use a bevel up draw knife for. And, and this one is not the one I use. I usually use this, this Barton here that is a, is a beast. It's got a whole lot of mass right here. And so it's, it's my go-to knife for prepping stock at first, but you know, you, you don't have to have two knives or 20 knives. You can just have one knife and you can make it work for all those purposes. Now the bevel down knife, uh, obviously if you're doing any type of, of concave work, then it works better. You can flip the bevel up knife over and use it for, for some of that. But if you're doing too much of it, then it, it might, might not feel good in your, in your wrist. Now, because they have different uses and they're used, they're used differently, one with the bevel up, one with the bevel down, they're sharpened differently. This one's straightforward. The bevel down knife is straightforward. It is just exactly like uh, a bench chisel. I grind the uh, bevel here to about a 28 degree angle, something like that. And that angle, and uh, you know, I don't, uh, don't want to give you too much like uh, beginner information, but 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 that 28 degree bevel is a balance between the the metal being able to hold the edge and you being able to pull the the tool through the wood. So you start getting up up into the 30s, you know, 32, 33 degree angle. Very difficult. You can feel the difference. Very difficult to pull that draw knife through the through the wood. And you get down below 28, and the edge will roll over with you. It can't, it can't hold that edge. So the 28, that's where you come up with the 28, 29 degrees, whatever. And of course, you know, it's less if you're working soft wood, maybe like a Japanese woodworker might be not, not working hickory or something. But uh, uh, so I would grind the bevel to 28, 28 degrees, and then I keep the back flat. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. I work it up through my stones to, I, I just go up to 8,000 grit. Uh, I find that sufficient for the work that I do. Uh, this one here, I start out similar. I grind this to a 25 degree angle and then hone it, go up through the stones, but you have to roll that edge a bit or you won't be able to take a shaving, it'll dive down, it'll push it down. Now that's the trick because th this one's straightforward to sharpen. It's, uh, I mean, it's hard because it's eight inches of, of tool you're trying to sharpen there, but it's not like, it's not like trying to roll this edge and maintain that. What you, what you want to do when you're sharpening, when you're sharpening anything is you have to have repeatability. Getting it sharp once is, is, is not what you're after. It's getting in sharp a hundred times and being able to do it fast because, uh, you know, especially if you're making your living at woodworking, you're not being paid to sharpen tools. Well, I guess you are in a way, but uh, but you need to get to work. And so so you need to you, you need to have a system to where you do A, B, C, D, the tool sharp, and, and you go back to work. And when you're rolling this edge right here, you've got to be able to repeat that. And that's difficult because once you roll that edge, then you don't know where it is. And in order to find it again, you have to pick up your, uh, you know, your strop or whatever it was that you were rolling it with a little more and a little more and a little more. And that's increasing that angle and making it blunter and blunter and blunter. It might be sharp, but now it's too blunt to really do you any good. And with the bevel up knife, 
the other downside thing that happens is you start having to pick it up right like this, which you lose power off of it. As you pick that thing up, you can see if the blade's in line with your with your hands and your arms, how much power you're going to get off of it. And also you lose the ability of the bevel up knife to track also. So 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 you got to be careful with that. And 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 I'll show you, I'll show you how I how I do it. And maybe you can see on the film how this one's been hollow grind back here and uh, uh, you know, rough. It's just holding it up to the to the grinder and freehanding it. Uh, and this one, yeah, you can still see the hollow grind on this one. I've been honing on this one for years, and so it's getting smaller and smaller, but you can still see it. Let me get that dust off of it there. Okay, now, now you can see it. You can see the, the edge where it's shiny out here at the, the edge. Uh, so, uh, Curtis, a couple of questions have come up about that edge. Um, one is, are there draw knives with bevels on both edges? And then what, can you, can you elaborate a little more by what you mean by rolling the edge? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen a few different versions of knives with bevels on, on, on both sides. And, uh, one of them was a contemporary knife made by Ray Larson, I think. It was, it was, a, it was a good looking knife, but, but it seems like it was made, uh, the bevels were really long on the thing. And one side was, was convex, uh, a bear to sharpen and to, and to repeatedly sharpen, uh, a real bear. Uh, so I, I didn't understand that, that, that knife or why you would want a knife like that. Maybe, you know, somebody else loves that knife and could tell me why, why they like it, but I don't. But here's the one that I know that kind of has a bevel on both sides, and that's this Barton. So, so right here, so the bevel is over here. The let's just call this the one I would be grinding is over here. But, and if you look at the back of the knife, the back of the knife is in line with the tang. But there's another bevel here, a big one, which is at an angle. Now, what that allows me to do, so I just create a back. So this is the back of the knife to me. Okay, but there's a big bevel on it. So what I do, if I can grind this and hone this, and then grind this side and hone this. Now, this I pretty much maintain like I would the back of a chisel. In other words, you don't, you after you get it all slick and nice, you only touch it with your with your final stone, with your 8,000 grit stone just to turn the burr back the other way. And then you chase the burr back and forth and back and forth, back and forth till you go crazy. But uh, and eventually it falls off and you have a sharp, a sharp knife. Uh, so that would be the, 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 the ones with the bevel on both sides. Uh, other, other than that, this is the only old knife I've ever seen uh, like that. Uh, and I've never seen an old knife like knife the way that Ray Larson made, made his. Uh, he made a bunch of them, and uh, I mean, they're beautiful knives, and looks like they're real good work, but I, I don't understand that knife or know much about it. Uh, so as far as, to the second question, as far as dubbing that edge over, I call it rolling the edge or whatever, dubbing it over, uh, I will show you that as we as we start to sharpen. Uh, and so before I move over to the to, to the grinder, because we'll we'll start out there. We're gonna move over to the grinder. John, is there, is there any other question I should answer before I go there? Uh, yeah, there's one question here about uh, those higher grits you use. You mentioned up to 8,000. Is that wet or dry? Yeah, so, say that. Uh, Do, are you wet? using wet stones or dry stones? Oh, I use, I use wet, I use, I use water stones. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and you'll see me do that. I'll get, I'll get to that here. And, and then someone was curious if you have any folding draw knives. Uh, no, I fold, folding draw knives have come through my hands before, but I, I don't I don't like them. They seem cumbersome to me. Uh, you know, they 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 seem like I'm I'm losing a connection with the with the blade some way. Uh, and and you know, so 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 I've seen there's two draw knives out there, two old draw knives where the handles move. One of them is the folding kind, where the handles have a slot cut in them right here, and and you got a uh, 
a wing nut out here. You loosen it up and the handle folds over and protects the blade. You know, genius if you're throwing that thing in your toolbox and traveling around as a carpenter. But here in the shop, you don't, you don't need that. You would never ever close it up. Uh, so, so this, I just don't like that cumbersome enough. It just doesn't feel right to me. The other one is the adjustment this way. And that would be pretty neat because you've, you know, you could make it a bevel up or bevel down draw knife, just whatever you want that day. Uh, and I've had a few of those, but I've never liked, in fact, there's still one up on the wall. Yeah, it's still up on the wall way over there on that other side. Uh, this, uh, this, this old fellow, I was demonstrating one day years ago and uh, out at a park and a guy came by and he said, uh, a lot of the old people down there call them drawing knives. He said, I got an old drawing knife. And he goes, you want it? And I said, yeah. And so he went and got it and brought it back and gave it to me. He said, he said, when I die, I don't want it hung on the wall. Now it's hung on the wall. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like, I'll find somebody to give that to. I'll find, I'll find some young needy person who uh, can put that drawn out to use. So, okay, we'll go over to the, uh, to the grinder here. <clears throat> How's that? Does that work pretty good, Eric? Yep. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I've if I've just picked up a draw knife from the uh, uh, flea market or junk store or or, or whatever, uh, you know, it needs it needs to be worked on. Uh, and uh, now, if you're buying a new knife, they should come all ready. But I don't. I don't. Uh, I, you know, there's some good knives out there, but but I I, I like the old knives. So. Um, so the first thing I would do is to flatten the back, and you've got a you got a lot of metal right there to to flatten. So I would I would hollow grind that, and so I would just um, take the tool rest like this. This is a oh, this is a one way I guess a Wolverine jig I think one way does it. I don't know. You can see how old mine is. I can't, I can't even remember who it is. And then uh, uh, I got this stick here with some. Uh, rare earth magnets in it and uh, I had a apprentice with me about oh, 12 or 13 years ago Andy Jack he lives up in northwest Connecticut great chair maker and uh, uh, he's the one that that showed me how how to do this uh, and so this is notched but it's arced this way and this way so the knife can roll on it and so I just stick it down right there and first thing I do, like I said, is to flatten the back. So I need to hollow grind it so I'm not removing so much metal. So I would get it, I would just keep testing it and testing it to where I get that position just right. And I'm able to run it on the back side and put a little hollow grind back here. And then I would just take it to, uh, you know, a coarse stone at first or some coarse sandpaper. You glue some sandpaper on a piece of, of granite. Uh, you know, one thing that's great is you can go get these, uh, you can get a granite tile from your, your home center and have them cut it. They'll cut it there and cut it into thirds and a 12 by 12 tile. So you'll have uh, four by 12 and you can just uh, glue sandpaper on that three different grades. And you've got you, you know, that tile will cost you a dollar or something and you've got you great sharpening stones right there for hardly, hardly any money. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so anyway, you can start out with with a real coarse stone or, you know, of course, diamonds are great, but they're expensive. And uh, uh, but you can start out just with 220 sandpaper and get that thing flat and scratched all the way up to the edge. And somebody may have rolled that edge and you're just going to have to go all the way all the way out to it because you can't have you can't have a big dubbing on on the back of that knife. Uh, and. Uh, you know, first off, though, if you've got any nicks in it, you know, sometimes you'll find them, they got a big old nick in it, you'd want to joint it. So you're going to stick it right up to the grinder, right like that, and just blunt that thing and grind it all the way back. Now, what you want to try to do is to mimic the arc uh, or or straight, whatever you've got back here, because sometimes the drawn eye's been ground and it's, you know, longer on one side than the other. And uh, so I would measure as I'm jointing that and get it to where I've got the same measurement all the way across. That would be the first thing. 
Well, actually, let's back up one more. The very first thing is a lot of times some numbskull has hit this with a hammer. I don't know what they're doing, but you find a lot of them done like that. And this one's been hit with a hammer. And this is soft metal back here. So you can take a file and file that smooth right there. That would be the very first thing is file that smooth. Then joint the edge to where it's the same distance all the way across. Then uh, put a little hollow grind in the back there. <clears throat> and then take it over and work all the way up through the grits of your stone until you polish it with 8,000. Now you're ready to start the sharpening process. So then you're going to grind this bevel right here. And once again, I'll use this and I'll just set it up right like that until I'm hitting just where I want for a 28 degree bevel. Now, the question is, how do you know you're at 28 degrees? Well, I don't know any way to do that besides just getting it to where you're guessing at first and putting a, a little flat of a grind on it and then sticking some measuring device on it like that, like that right there, uh, and then adjusting it. Now, once you get it there, then every time I have to, to regrind, and I don't grind it much, I'll, I'll, I mean, I sharpen it all the time but I don't come back to grind it much. So I'll put that marker on it and then I'll just keep rolling the grinder until it's hitting right in the middle of that bevel. So I know I've got it, okay? Now, so then once I've got it to where it's at the angle that I want, I turn the grinder on and I grind on the side of the grinder cause the motor's in the way. That's all it is, just the motors in the way. So I grind on the side of the grinder. You put some wax in there and get it to where it runs smooth. And, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got this smooth and you've got that edge running parallel with that edge right there, then you're going to get this beautiful hollow grind on that thing. Uh, and uh, if you've jointed the edge, then you're going to have to grind it all the way down to where all those flats are gone. Uh, if not, if you're just regrinding, like I'd be regrinding here, you could grind it all the way out to the edge if you want. More often than not, I try to stop just a little bit shy of the of the edge, so I don't have to do so much so much honing. Because if I take that grinder all the way up to the edge, I'm going to have to start all the way back with my coarsest stone and and work my way work my way up. <laughs> so someone had asked, is that a, a low speed grinder? Uh, yeah, good, good, good question. Yeah, this is a, a 800 RPM uh, grinder, 800, excuse me, 18, 1800, as opposed to your typical grinder that's, that's 36. Yeah, this is 1800. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so it's a, uh, and as you can see, it ain't any guards on it. I'm, 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 I'm a pretty safe guy, you know. I mean, I don't remove guards off of things. This never had any guards on it to begin with. And uh, so I've, I've never put them on it, but I wear safety glasses and I'm, I'm very careful with what I do because I've cut myself off. <laughs> I don't like to cut myself. Okay, so before we leave the grinder, any questions? There, there are a couple more uh, here okay. on, the, on the hollow grind. So, um, one question is, is the hollow grind on the back of the knife just along the back of the blade between the tangs or do you hollow grind the entire width of the blade? Yeah, I hollow grind the entire width of the blade all the way from there to there. Uh -huh. And from about right there, well, as close as you dare get to the edge and then maybe about right, right there or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more that you take out, the less work you're going to have to do to flatten it. But you don't want to hit it on the backside up against the edge or you're, you, you've, you've made yourself a lot of work and maybe even ruin the knife. Uh, a question, does the uh, hollow ground affect the, the long-term, uh, uh, let's see what they say here, the, the, um, the future life of the knife, it says. No. Okay. There's a lot of metal here.
Okay, got it. Um, how about the Galbraith draw sharp? Do you, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, Peter. it works. It works. It works great. <laughs> it it, it works. I don't. I don't. I'll have one. It works great. Uh, you know, I, I I just like to use what I got, and I like to keep it simple. I don't. I don't. Uh, I'm not one to buy many jigs and gizmos. I, I I feel I feel once you learn how to do it by hand, then it opens up all kinds of possibilities for you. Um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's just like, it's just like sharpening your bench chisel. If, if you learn how to grind your bench chisel with just something like this, and then take it straight over to the stone and find that bevel and hold it and hone it all the way up. It's so much faster. You don't have to buy something. You don't have to find a place to put it, uh, I mean, you can buy a lot of stuff and, and it takes up a lot of space and it takes a lot of time to, to put it together and, and into use. And all the stuff that you can do more freehand, the better. And sharpening is one thing that, that you can do freehand. You have to teach yourself how to, how to do it. I had to teach myself how to do it. I didn't know how to do this. You know, I mean, when I first started grinding drawing, I was, I was scared to death. Oh God, I'm going to ruin it. Well, yeah, you might. <laughs> you might. So maybe go buy a junk one. And, and 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 grind on it, uh, and and then soon you get you get confidence uh, with it, and, uh, and and you can move move right through it. Uh, but all, you know, also the, the the jigs lock you in, and and you just don't have the flexibility that I uh, that I that I like. But 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 with that said, uh, you know, Pete's thing is, is great. It's 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 made on this on exactly. On 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 this this style or or, or or this this I don't know what I'm looking for the word I'm looking for what I'm looking for here the word idea I'm, this idea yeah good <laughs> tough word there this this idea right here uh, uh, I mean I mean you know it's it, it's it's locked in something in back of it at an angle and you can move that and bring it back and push it and bring it back up exactly like this right here so. Uh, so I am using a little jig, a little gizmo here, but it was found on the floor. Uh, so anyway, okay, we'll go over to the stones then. But if you got a question about the grinder, go ahead and ask it and we'll get over here, I'll answer it. Okay. So this piece of granite, and I'm sure it's made to lay it on its side right like this. But I'm always sharpening draw knives. I sharpen chisels and spoke shaped blades and every once in a while even a plane blade, although I don't use planes uh, as much as, as you know cabinet makers do. Uh, but, uh, uh, but with the draw knife, the handles are in the way. And so years ago, I turned this thing over on the edge and found out that it works, it works great. And the stone just sits right up here and it's, it's wonderful. So I would, uh, I would start out, so my stones are just right back here. Uh, and uh, they're, the coarse stones are sitting in water and the fine stones are, are up here out of, out of the water like this one is. But uh, uh, so I, I use water stones, all kinds, I mean, any of that stuff works, any of it works. Okay. Uh, this is what I have. When I first started woodworking in the early 80s, the water stones were, were the thing and, and it's what I bought. And uh, so it's, it's, it's about all I know how to, uh, how to use. So, so they all work. Um, so what you would do is in flattening the back, Putting your coarse stone on there, or you can. There's a piece of 220 grit sandpaper right here. I was flattening something and had it had it on there. You can set it right down on that, right like that. Set it on that, and just hone that. I hone it right like this. Uh, and the idea is to remove all the scratches of the previous stone. <clears throat> uh, if you're moving from one stone too fast to the next, uh, you're you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, so you got to move the scratches. And then when you're ready to hone over here on this side, 
this is a little bit trickier, but you, you can learn how to do it. Um, so put a little water on it. So these hard stones, you don't soak them in water. You just keep water on them because they don't soak it up so fast. Whereas the, uh, so, so the, the grits of my stones are 800, uh, 1200, 4000, and this is an 8000. Uh, and this is a Nagura stone, Nagura stone. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and you work up a little bit of grit on, on these guys. And uh, then you just fill where that bevel is, right like that. And like that. And then I'll flip it over, turn the burr back, take it back, take it back. And then a lot of times I'll switch to, to this. This is a, a little easy lap thing. And I've had this thing for, for 30 years. It wore out 25 years ago. But I found instead of going out and buying another one, I found that I can just put grit on it right like that. And then I can can turn that burr back about like that. Now, and then I can take it on this side. You put your finger right there, you can feel exactly where that bevel is and run it along through there right like that. Okay. Now, this, you can cut yourself with this. What will happen is, it'll start drying up and the, the grit, will catch and you're just honing away and the stone stays in one spot and your finger slides right over there and it slides it open. And you know, you can ask me how I know that. Um, so what I found is that if you spit on it, it's a lot slicker and it will never do that. So I'll spit on it and it just keep, I haven't told you that have I here. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, it just like it just keeps going and keeps going. It will never like lock up, lock up on you. Uh, now, now you might be able to get it exactly where you want it, right like that. If not, if you need it just a little bit sharper, you can take um, this is leather right here. But you got to be careful with the leather because you'll dub the edge. And dubbing the edge does two, well, it does three things. One is it'll make it sharper <laughs> because you're rubbing it with this leather. But the other is it's rolling it a little bit, which is increasing the angle of it. And then the other, which is probably the worst thing, is that you can't repeat it. It's hard to repeat it. You have to maybe do it a little more and pick it up, a little more and pick it up, and you keep getting dub, you know, greater angle and greater angle. Now, I do the same thing with this. I just rub it on that right there. I've already got it there. It's ready to go. And then I try to hold that bevel to where I'm not rolling it much at all. Like that. And I usually won't do it on the back of a flat <clears throat> of a bevel down draw knife. And I'll show you the bevel up knife in just, just a minute. And uh, I find a clean spot on this thing. Uh, now I check, you can check your, I mean, you can run your fingernail across it right like that and see if you got any nicks in it. It ought to just be smooth as silk across through there. And then you can take your fingernail at a low angle and see if it grabs it, like it's grabbing it all, all the way across. But really, the ultimate way to check an edge is uh, with a piece of pine. <laughs> Nothing is as hard to cut as a piece of eastern white pine. And the reason why is it's like sl slicing an apple and a tomato. You can slice an apple with a, with a kitchen knife, but 
you can't slice a tomato but anything that's razor sharp and uh, it just smushed with you. And that's what happens with this white pine. It'll just smush with you. And uh, so if you can, if you can get a, uh, a real waxy surface off of it, Now, see that white that's on that? So I don't have it where I should have it. There's too much white. I got a nice peeling. I got a nice ingrain peeling off of it. But uh, I'm getting some wax right there. Waxy look right there. There it goes. Yeah. So part of the life, there it goes. That, that's what you want. So right in here, it's where I want it. But right over here, it's not. It was showing that. That, that white, and that white means it's tearing a little bit. I mean, it's sharp, but you get it like this and you're gonna love working with it. It's gonna love working with it. It's just, I mean, that's just, that's just nice to feel right there. So, uh, okay, so we'll go back over here and I'll show you this uh, um, bevel up knife right here, okay. So like I said, I'm gonna grind this one at 25. And the reason why is because I'm gonna roll that edge a little bit. And my guess, and it's just a guess, is that that's gonna be about, add about three degrees to that, to that angle, okay? Now, one advantage to honing that, to grinding that at 25 as opposed to 28 is it makes a little bit longer bevel, which is easier to hold on, on the stone. One disadvantage is it makes a little bit longer bevel, which can't get into as tight of a curve, right? But that's not a huge disadvantage. So here's, now that I'm on that, let me just mention that in a second. This is my knife that's dedicated for really tight curves. And so it would be like that cut out on a shield seat on the bottom side of the shield seat of a, of a Windsor chair, getting in there with the knife. You need something that's really short. So what that is, that is a result of the thickness of the knife this way. It has nothing to do with the width of the knife this way. It's the thickness right here, coupled with the angle that you ground on it. So this one's ground at a higher angle. It's up around 31 or 32 to decrease that bevel. And that bevel is only 3 16 long, but it enables me to get inside those real tight cuts. And the reason I have a dedicated knife is because that's what I do for a living. I do it all the time. And I always have that area to get into with a knife. And so I can grab this knife and then you hang it back up. If you tried to use this knife as a general purpose knife, then that bevel, it would be really difficult to get a good straight pull with this thing. That bevel is so short. Your bearing surface is just so short on it. But that's what this knife is for. Now, the knife that I was just using is a good compromise between, if you have one knife, I would want a knife like this right here. The bevel is long enough to where I can, I can you know, rough out stock and get some good straight pulls with it, but I can still get into some curves uh, and not, not as much as the other one, but some curves. Okay, so let's go back to here. So like I was saying, this gets 25 degrees and then I'm guessing that I'm adding about three degrees to the dubbing or the, the rolling over the edge. Now that, and of course the reason like I said that you're doing that is so you can come out of the cut. If it's flat, you can't come out of the cut. And um, so, uh, you know, somebody was telling me one time that they didn't keep their, their, their draw knife flat on the back and they used it bevel up and they were able to come out of the cut. And, but theoretically that's, that's, that's impossible. You can't, you can't do that. So they probably didn't know it, but when they were sharpening it, they were rolling that edge over a little bit. And uh, so this is the way, this is one way of doing it. And that is to Use your leather strop and put a lot of pressure out there on the edge. And you just keep doing that. 
and you'll get a little tiny like micro bevel out there on it. And then you try to use it and see if you can come out of the cut. If you can't, then you got to do it a little bit more. Now that means that it's repeatable. So you can, you can do the exact same thing every time. Just put a lot of pressure out here, referencing off the bat, but it's just barely touching it or riding a little bit up above it and doing that. Now, if you can't get enough, uh, dubbing like that to be able to to come out of the cut then you can do it with this right here but you really have to know how much you're, you're you're lifting it up and do it the same every every single time and but use the back as as a reference point you're just talking about just slightly picking it up and you can pick it up and then run it along the back side right like that okay Okay, so let's take some questions on on sharpening then, if, if there are any, John. Yeah, um, a, a couple people wanted to see a little more close-up view of that little block of wood with the two magnets. Oh, okay. Uh, for the grinder. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, the rare, the rare magnets are used for getting into position, but it won't hold that position to the grind. So once I get it at the right position, then I clamp it. So this is all it is. It's just, it's cut out in a notch right there. And then it's rounded that way. And it's rounded that way. That stuff right there, that's where it gets too close to the grind. Uh, yeah. So sometimes I have to go that far. Able to cut it, and then, and then I just, I made an improvement to Andy's uh, little jig here. I put the red magnets in there because it's hard to adjust it. But with these guys, it's real easy. And and then a couple other questions. Um, since you didn't have that grinder on, wondering is the grinder turning into the blade, and then also. Is an eight inch grinder too large for the hollow ground? Uh, yeah, let's go over here to. <clears throat> uh, let me grab. <clears throat> so yeah, the grinders are turning this way. Yeah, that's what that's what they're always doing. Uh, uh, eight inch grinders. So years ago, I had, I had an eight inch grinder and the issue with the eight inch grinder is, 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 is this right here. One is it, 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 it didn't fit this real good. It was, it was quite light. Uh, but the other thing is this right here. If you've got an eight inch grinder, let's see if I can simulate this. There you go. Sometimes the tool wrist is way down here low. And, and, and so in order to freehand grind, and I mean, you're not completely freehand, you got it on this, this, this rest here, but in order to freehand it, you know, this way, these things are, I, I think, yeah, well, I'm not gonna say these things are crazy. You, you might use them and get good use out of them. The little miter slot there, man, that locks you right in. Your stone has to be perfectly flat. And it's gotta be perfectly lined up and all that. Whereas if you're doing it by hand, you just adjust it to what's going on. And I always crown my stone. So you're only grinding right in the center of it. Uh, so you're allowed leeway. You don't have to get it perfect, you know. Uh, but back to the eight inch, eight inch stone. What, the way I like to, to grind, say a chisel or a, or a spoke shape blade or something is right like this. Then the blade's just resting right on that tool rest and you aren't having to not only maintain it up against the stone but grab you don't you aren't fighting gravity that's what i'm that's what I'm, that's what i'm looking for you aren't fighting gravity uh you're letting gravity gravity work for you uh so something like right like that whereas the eight inch stone I, I i i've always been down way far down on those things on on the edge of the stone and you know you're having to hold the blade up while it's trying to slide down so, uh, okay anything Anything else? 
Uh, that looks like it as far as sharpening questions. Would you, would you like to have some other questions at this point? Uh, sure, because I'm going to I'm going to go to using the draw knife, and so now would be a good time. Let's walk over here to the. Video. So, so a couple of questions about um, handles. Uh, any tips on a, a handle that's loose and wiggles, or if uh, another question is one that's bent? Yeah. So one that's bent, you should be able to straighten that. That's that's I. You know, I'm not a metal, player, so I really don't don't know, but. But but I've straightened out those those handles. If if you uh, you know and you could probably be able to straighten them out a little bit just with with them cold. But if you want to heat them up, then you take a wet rag and you wrap it around the blade, and to keep the blade cool. And then you can heat that handle up. And you know because I've seen handles that don't line up. One of them's like this, one's like that, and. Uh, you, you need to straighten those things up. So, so, so that's that's what you would do. You could heat it up, bend it like that. Uh, loose handles, yeah, that's that's a, a problem. Uh, you know that that tang is rectangular in in shape, a, a tapered rectangular, and uh, and that wood's just gotten loose in there. And I don't know any way. I mean, maybe it's just a little bit loose. You could get off that peening right there. And to drive the handle back up more and that cap right there, put it on it and hang it back over again. But I've never had a lot of luck with, with that. I've, I've replaced handles before. Where's the replacement? <clears throat> right here. This, these handles were just rotten and I replaced those. But these had real short handles on them and I didn't, I didn't like the short handle. And so I put these longer handles on it. And uh, uh, so the tang was only this long. And so I just used epoxy in there and it's worked fine now. You know, I don't know what would happen if you had to replace the handles again. And that might be blasphemy for somebody on a tool. But once again, I'm trying to get the tool to work. So whatever works is fine with me. And this epoxy has worked for years and years. Uh, and, uh, and I guess you could do that just on, if your handle's in good shape and it's loose and you can't to tighten up. Because I don't really know the way. I mean, that, that wood's wore out in there and, and you're, not gonna, you're not gonna get that tight. So, uh, yeah, if you wanted to, you could use epoxy. Then it's all over the tang. And like I said, if you ever had to replace it, you might have an issue there. But at least you'd be able to use the knife for the end. And uh, I mean, somebody else might have a better solution than that. But those are the solutions that I've that I've used. And then, can you comment on the the difference between or or your preference on a straight draw knife uh, as opposed to a curved draw knife? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't have any. Uh, uh, I, uh, no, no, no. I don't. They, they're, any of them are fine. This is a great knife right here. And it's straight. Uh, it's a, a swan, I think. I think that's what that one is. But uh, yeah, it's a real good knife. Uh, Alia Bazari, who worked with me years ago, he he reads a lot more than I do and researches a lot more. And he told me that these knives sold more in the, you can find old Montgomery Ward's catalogs where they have these knives. And he said the straight knives cost $3.50 and the curved knives cost $2.50. The curved knives, so, so, so I guess that means that they were using tool steel, less tool steel. And maybe these were all tool steel in them. And that's why they were more expensive. That, you know, that's just a little, FYI. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and then there's a couple of questions about the bevels. Um, and I'm not sure I'll, I'll ask the question as written here, but I'm not sure I know what it means. Uh, so what would the thickness be for the tight curve versus the regular blade? That, that would be the thickness of the blade, I believe. And then another one here, what is the width of the bevel on the blade? Worked on that was more shallow bend. 
got the train coming through here. I'll answer that first one, and we might have to go back over the second. Okay. Crossing right there now. So that's the thickness of that knife right there. This is about the thinnest knife I've ever found. Is a hundred thousandths, which um, I guess is a hundred and twenty thousandths, an eighth of an inch. Somebody out there in the audience knows. Uh, I, I, I think, I, and and I think a hundred thousandths is less than that. So that's that's really really thin. Uh, the this knife right here would be typical of what you would find. Uh, Yeah, 180 thousandths. Now uh, oh, that one's pretty small, about 115. I didn't know that. So anyway, yeah. So that's what you would you would be looking at if you were looking for something uh, small would be 100 thousandths or, or, or less. And uh, this is one that. Uh, that I use for some time. This is a beautiful knife. Uh, Alia gave this one to me. He, <clears throat> he had some system he had for <coughs> putting beautiful holograms on the back. Yeah, it's about 105. <clears throat> so, uh, and what was that second question? <clears throat> Something about the width of Okay, I, I had to get unmuted there. Yes, um, that one. So what is the width of the bevel on the blade you worked on that was more shallow bend? Uh, I think they want to know the length of the bevel. Yeah. Length of the bevel. I think that one that was, it, that was intended for the inside curves on the shield shaped seat is the one they're referring yeah. to and the width of the bevel. Yeah, so the width of this bevel is three sixteenths. So it's very, very small. Uh, as you can see on most of these other knives, you know, that one's running up, uh, uh, gosh, three eighths for sure, double, double the size of that one. And the other ones all run about that, a quarter to eighths. Yeah. Now, if you get a big bevel, So, so this is a knife made by, by Bar Tools. It's a, it's a knife for roughing out, for roughing out stuff with. It's, it's thick, it's a real thick knife. But when you put a 28 degree bevel on it, uh, you, get a, you get a huge, you get a really long, long bevel. Uh, yeah, that thing's running 17. So, you can't do much of a curve with it at all, but it tracks. It tracks like a bevel butt knife for roughing out stock, for getting good straight pulls, and a lot of power with the knife because it's got so much, so much meat to it. But as a general purpose, all-purpose knife, then it's limited as to what it can. Do. Uh huh. Why don't, why don't you go ahead with the demonstrations then? Uh, go ahead with the demonstration. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Eight. So I'm just going to use just this. Like I said, usually when I rough out, I grab the part, but I'm just going to just going to use this and. I split out a piece of red oak earlier today and I chose one on purpose that had curves in both directions, <clears throat> right like that. Because what you do with the draw knife is you follow those long wood fibers. You aren't trying to straighten this thing out, you're following the long wood fibers. And uh, 
So, so one way to do that, one way to know if you're in the plane, like, like right there, I'm in that plane now, I can tell. But if you, you can dig your little trough and you know that's below both those planes right there. And then you can pull right like that. You let the knife talk to you. Uh, so now if I stick it in there and pull, you can see right, right there was a little bit, but it's not grabbing. It's not picking up any wood fibers. So that's following just the way the tree grew. Now I flip it around and I know that's built up right there. So I'll get rid of a lot of stuff right there. Now I'm there. Now I can, I can come this way because I could have gone downhill over here. And if I did, I wouldn't be picking up any long wood fibers, but I can check it by coming back this way. And you see, I picked up a little bit. So I did go downhill at least a little bit over there. So I heard a little bit of splitting there, a little bit of splitting sound right there. That means there's some long wood fibers there that need to come off. Okay, now let's see where we are. Yeah, see, it's not grabbing with me now. I can engage the knife, and you need a real sharp knife to do this. I can engage that knife, and it's not picking up anything. And I can check myself by turning it around. Same thing. It's not digging in. It's not grabbing. It's not picking up any of the wood fibers. So I'm in the plane that the tree grew in, which is what you want. It's very crooked. That's what you want. <clears throat> Then I'll go to the tangential plane. So that's the radial plane. You can see that you can probably catch in the light those major Leary rays that Oak has that's so pronounced. Uh, the radial plane is the easiest plane to cut in, and that's why I always start in the radial plane. Now I go to the tangential plane right here, which would be where the growth rings are running right like that. And now here, it's harder to cut in this plane but it's easier to tell if you're in the long wood fiber plane because it's color coded. You can see those growth rings. You can see it from up here and you can also look on the side that you just cut and just sight right down it. You can see it, it but you're gonna do it the exact same way. I can just sight down the thing and I can see that I'm not there. I got off somewhere. There we go. Okay. So the first thing I would do in making any part is the kind of similar to what a cabinet maker would do. First thing cabinet makers got to do is get two sides flat and square to each other. And if he does it, it's going to hone in the rest of the project. That's the two most important cuts in the whole entire project is that because they're what everything follows them, relies on them to be straight and square. Here, you want to follow the, we're not worried about straight and we're not worried about square, square. Sort of square is fine but we want to follow those long wood fibers in both planes. Cause if we don't, when we get over here, it's going to tear out somewhere. And I want to be able to use that draw knife with reckless abandon. I want to know that whenever I, whenever I take, let's say I want, this is set for 13 16. So this would be the size of roughing out a spindle. That would be the large bulb on the spindle. And uh, so I would mark it with marking gauge. And you can see how rough my marking gauge is. And that's what I want. Uh, I don't want anything fine. I want to be able to see those, uh, uh, see all those tears, those little fibers tore. And I want to be able to cut right like that. And I can see when those fibers are gone, so I don't even have to look over. I can see when the draw knife removes those guys that, uh, that I'm there right on, right on the line. And then I can flip it around and uh, So if I hadn't have done my work over here on this side, then either back here, over here, it would have split out with me. 
And if I needed that dimension here, then, then, then I'm hurt and I've gone below it. And same way when you when you starting to round it with a spoke shape, you want to be able just to cut without even thinking about grain direction. It's going to work with you because you follow the long wood fibers. And uh, so we can, so to kind of finish up a spindle, I guess I would just kind of, this is already in the, in the plane I wanted in, so no, no reason to do anything there. It's, this is where the bevel down really comes in. So this, say this, say this is going to be the bottom of the spindle. Here's the bulb right here. Round. I would come in and form my tenon. There's the tenon going into the seat in the square. And then I would come up however far I need to come up. Well, I'm not paying much attention. I got a little thinner than what I'd normally get a spindle. And now I take it to an octagonal right there. It's a draw knife. And what you want, the closer you get it to a perfect octagonal, then the better the spindle's going to look, the less spoke shave work you have to do, the more fun the spoke shave work's going to be. So taking your gross tool further than you usually take it, is a great way to learn. Just push yourself. And that's what the, the democratic chair is all about. If y'all know about the chair that, that I <clears throat> made. And it, it's, it's taken from a term that, that Bill Cockerthwaite used that a lot of people know about the democratic tool, a tool that's, that's available to a larger portion of the world's population. They're not eliminated from it because of their economic stance. And, uh, and so, so this 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 chair, that Windsor chair that I kind of designed, is to be made almost completely with a draw knife. You know, a couple other tools, of course, got to bore a hole. Uh, and uh, and and but but you know, so so not only is it the democratic chair, in a way, in Copperthwaite's uh, terms, but also it's a great chair for pushing your tool further than you pushed it before and you move that point of diminishing returns by, by doing so. And your, your work becomes more, uh, becomes faster, it becomes more fun and it becomes better also. So uh, anyway, so there's a two cent of a spindle up there. But, uh, but. Yeah, somebody, somebody uh, wondered about uh, the danger of cutting yourself with that draw knife when you're pulling it toward you. And uh, any uh, any tips or thoughts on that? You mean like you talking about cutting yourself like? Yeah, that? I yeah. think so. Well, you got little shock absorbers built in. You know, it just can't go any further any further than that right there. Now, when the the cuts that you get on the draw knife are on your hands, and it's from holding one hand right like this and talking. And so you know, one time I was teaching down at. Uh, Highland Hardware, Highland Woodworking in Atlanta. And uh, I'm sitting on the shaving horse first day talking about the draw knife, talking about all the safety issues of the draw knife and all that. And I'm, and it's this one, it was this exact knife. And I'm waving that thing around and I laid it into that finger right there, cut all the way down to the bone, cut the extender tendon. That thing was sticking down like that. I had to go into surgery. So <laughs> don't, you know, hold it with two hands and you can't cut yourself. Now these corners are cut you too, so grind those off. So I forgot to say that when I'm when, when you're grinding, just grind those things off because they they'll, they'll bite you bad. You think? Uh, someone did ask about setting your draw knife down there. Are you concerned with uh, keeping it sharp when you set it on the edge? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the good point, 
it's a good point. My shaving horse is not as clean as I would like it to be. Uh, it's, it's, it's a habit uh, and it keeps it safe down there, you know, certainly does. And it's convenient. I mean, I could set it, if I'm next to the bench, a lot of times I'll set it right over here uh, and probably couldn't cut myself there. Uh, years ago, when Brian Boggs worked on a shaving horse all the time, he had a he had a hook back here, and he would always just hook his draw knife right back here, and it always went there. So so it didn't it didn't. But but I mean that is a good point. This is you know it's never as clean as you would want it to be for setting an edge tool down on it. But yeah, maybe maybe I ought to rethink that. <laughs> But not right now. <clears throat> I, I think we've covered uh, questions pretty well. I, I've tried to, uh, you know, group a few of them together. Similar questions about edges and grinders and things. I think we've covered everything. Okay. Okay. Well, if anybody has any question before we uh, before we go. Uh, I mean, we, yeah, we're supposed to run about an hour, I guess, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say? Well, thank you so much, Curtis. Thanks, John. Um, just going to add in a link here to Curtis's website. Um, you can go there, sign up for his email list. He'll he'll let you know if there's plan new plans available, anything like that. Um, it's um, been really ha wonderful having you, Curtis. Thanks so much. And thanks for your help too, Eric. It's been great having you on the camera so you can kind of get close and see the work firsthand here. It's a perspective that we wouldn't be able to even have in person. So it's great to have everybody here. Thanks everybody for, for being here with us tonight. Um, again, we've got Barn the Spoon tomorrow, noon central time. Uh, he'll be joining us from London to talk about green woodworking spoon carving. Um, John, thanks so much for being here and helping us host. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope we get to see you on campus at North House sometime in the next few years here. But regardless, thanks for being with us virtually uh, when we can't do this in person. Everybody have a good night and please, uh, yeah, check out Curtis's website for all sorts of really great plans and information and sign up for his email list. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night.